Snap No Tap podcast. Tony Cicchini here with, of course, Giuseppe Cardinale. Uh, we got uh, once again the, the the king of Poland, Martin Witkowski. We have a special guest that Joe will introduce in a few moments. Um, and uh, I got to open up by saying to some of my friends that are uh, that may be watching from Cleveland and some of my people that I know in Pennsylvania. Western Pennsylvania. This is addressed to you. The Cleveland Browns beat the shit out of the Steelers Thursday. Go Browns. They should be 3-0. and And to all you other guys, before you're going to try to get cocky with me, the Indians are going to clinch. Well, they're the Guardians now. They're going to clinch the division, hopefully today. Their magic number is one. So, hey, man, this is, this is good news. I'm on a roll. Um, and I need good news. I need to be in a good mood to deal with Joe. You know, everybody knows that it's a it's tough dealing with a walking human statue of perfection. Okay, that's what he wants to go by now. That's his new moniker. Um, but anyway, before I pass it over to Joe, just the quick updates. Um, the seminars are set. Uh, I put links to all my future current and future seminars whatever uh however you want to look at it on the front page of my website uh so you can look at it there's addresses there there's dates and times for the two that are upcoming in october they're running they're running they're going to be every month so uh, always check in there's also contact phone numbers i think or at least email addresses of the the guests the hosts which are uh in one case chuck may and the other, uh, Jason Bender, they've both been guests on here. Chuck is a high-ranking, well, retired police officer, high-ranking uh, Krav Maga. And Jason Bender is BJJ Black Belt. They're both students of mine, and they're both friends of mine. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, and I'm still doing the three-day, five-day intensive trainings. Uh, if anybody wants to sign up, now is about the time to start signing up for uh, like 2023, you know, because you need time to set everything up and, you know, get schedules coordinated. And as you guys should know, I don't, I only take a few people. Um, so if you're thinking about doing it now, you know, get, get started because Christmas is coming. Um, the winter's coming. So, um, anyway, I don't know if I have anything else to say right now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Joe. And if Martin has something to say before we introduce a very special guest, but I'm staying out of it now. Wake me up when the show's over. <laughs> well, I'm very happy for you, Tony, that your sports ball team is doing well. So I think sports I'm, ball, yeah, yeah sports <laughs> ball, whatever it is you did. This so, is just like last week when you called yourself an athlete. I mean, come on. I didn't say I was a good athlete. I just said I was an athlete. Let's be okay. clear. Okay. Um, but yeah, we have a, an interesting guest uh, today, uh, Peter Friedman, and he was actually recommended to us from someone I think who listens to the show or is, is you know, a fan, but I think this is basically our way of meeting Peter. Uh, I did check out his website, and I know you did too, Tony, and it's a very interesting background. I'm very curious to hear Peter's story. A lot of cool, interesting things on his website that I think our listeners will be into, and I'm, I'm very excited. You guys were chatting before the podcast honestly and i wish we were recording there's already good stories were coming out we uh, finally but... found the missing link i finally <laughs> found somebody after two years that knows mike hanak it's like i found bigfoot 
But yeah, welcome to the show, Peter. Oh, thank welcome. you for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime. This is great. Um, so, I mean, let's start at the beginning. Tell us your story. So, yeah, you know, uh, I saw on your website that you're you're from Boston. And as people start to listen, they for sure will hear the accent, I think. They will. Uh, I have an accent. <laughs> I think it's, or it's us that have the accent. right? Oh, yeah. I think you guys got the accent, not me. Yeah. I just have a problem with ours. I think they're overrated. <laughs> Well, Peter, yeah. So tell us about growing up in Boston and how you got involved in, uh, in athletics and martial arts. Well, I hope I don't bore anybody, but um, I started, well, my dad was a pro fighter in the ring and a bare knuckle fighter outside of the ring, a, a fist fighter. And uh, the first thing I learned was uh, like ring style boxing. So he started me off, you know, one year, just throwing a jab for one year with footwork. That's all I could do was throw a jab with the left hand. My right hand was uh, not used until the second year. So for a whole year, I was a young young man. I think I was like six or seven. And that's all I did was just throw a jab and how to turn it over and how to do footwork. And he basically taught me that the, the jab is how you keep your opponent off balance. Your jab measures distance. Your jab gauges, you know, your opponent's, um, uh, what do you call it? Mentality or personality. It, it it can tell you a little bit about your opponent, just a jab, right? And then from there, I learned the cross and the hook, the uppercut. I learned footwork, bobbing, weaving, the whole nine yards. He had me hitting speed bags, jumping rope, hitting heavy bags from a seated position, not a standing position. I'm sitting on my butt hitting a heavy bag. And then um, he told me later on, I, I as I got older, I wanted to learn uh, something a little bit more because you know you getting you know being young getting into street fights I, I really didn't get into fights with one kid um let me um shut my phone off if someone's calling me i'm gonna shut that off i hate to there it is slide the power off sorry about that guys um so i wanted to learn a little bit more because uh, i wouldn't get into fights at one person i'd get into fights at maybe two, three people at a time. I don't know why, but I just had that face and so my mouth has no filter and it doesn't know when to stop. <laughs> so he started teaching me bare knuckle box and where he started to, um, had me like squeeze a ball and strengthen my hands and put my hands in water with salt in it to toughen the skin up. And uh, he had me hitting the bag without gloves on. You, you tap it and you work your way up to power. And I had a really good punch. You know, if I hit someone, I could do some damage. And then I, um, I wanted to get into, uh, what was it? Uh, I think I, I got in trouble and I got shipped up to North Redden to stay with my brother for a while because I was getting into a lot of trouble. And I ended up joining the Y and training in Gojiru Karate with Ron Martin for a while in Lawrence. I think it was Lawrence. It was a long time ago. It was back in the 70s. And then from there, I started getting into trouble in North Redden and I had to move back to Boston. And, um, and I told my father, I wanted to go to karate school because I was doing it in Lawrence. My sister-in-law would take me to keep me out of trouble. It calmed me down the karate. So my father would take me around to different schools. And we went to one school after we went to a dozen and it was called the Academy of Ketsugo. And it was run by Robert L. Dickey. And he was the Shihan of that school. And Ketsugo is a word that means combination, mixture, put together, blending. And what it was, was it was uh, on, on the um, signboard and also in the yellow page ad, it said uh, Adiwaza, which was like karate, uh, judo, aikido, savat, French foot fighting, and jujitsu. And I never heard of savat. I never heard of Adiwaza. I heard of judo, aikido. I heard of karate. I heard of jujitsu. <clears throat> but I didn't hear these other things. So my father took me there to watch a class. And while we were there, he um, uh, watched them do the jujitsu. And while we, we were sitting down watching them train, and there was this one Chinese lady that took on three guys. They were brown belts, and she was like a green belt or something. And she threw these guys all over the place. I mean, they were really whacking each other. And my father leans over and whispers in my, my ear, he goes, you're coming here this is the school you're going to join. And I said, okay, cool. I don't care. I want to do something. Mm -hmm. So that's, I started uh, Ketsugu back in 70 or 71. And uh, I stuck with that for a while. And then I kind of, 
um, what happened? I stopped going there. I ran out of money or something. And then I got in trouble again. And then I ended up doing, I think I did Taekwondo with a guy named Dumb Pill Kim. I think it was in Kemore Square. He taught like the Rock Army in Korea. So his Taekwondo was a little different. It wasn't for sport. I trained with him for a few years. And then I ended up getting into uh, Kung Fu, Fu Jiao Pai. I only did that for a year with Wa Don Sifu. And uh, then from there, I ended up going to Jae Han Kim, which was a sports Taekwondo school. And I kept jumping around to different places because I, I felt that um, a lot of it wasn't effective for what I needed because I was getting into street fights every day. You know, you walk down the street, two, three people jump you and you got to defend yourself. So a lot of the stuff didn't work. The jujitsu worked right away. I noticed that. And the boxing worked. And, you know, the bare knuckle boxing from what my father taught me. He showed me how to use my elbows and my knees and how to kick people to the shin and how to use your chin. When you get close, you can put it in someone's eye and rub it in their eye and a lot of fun. And I, I kept going. I kept getting into different street fights. I got into a couple of knife fights. I got stuck once in the side. Two guys tried to hold me up in a, a train station. One guy got, I was walking down on the side of a wall. We were going underground in the train station in Boston. And this big guy steps in front of me. And as I went to go around him, another guy stepped on the side of me who was my height. And the guy in front of me was bigger. And the guy asked me for my money. And I told him no. And uh, he pulled out a knife. He showed me the knife and he goes, give me your money. I told him no again. I said, so then he stuck me in the side with the knife and um, what I did was I reacted by elbowing his uh, hand and I stepped through the bolt of him and I turned around and had my hands up. And I was ready to fight. We were going to throw hands. And the guy in front turned around and looked at the guy behind me and said, asked him where the knife was. And he says, down there. And so I guess the knife went flying way down the train station. And then those two started arguing and I just backed away and left. So that's what it was kind of like you know, me living in Boston, you know, growing up there. And then, of course, later I got it, got back into the Ketsugu Jiu-Jitsu years later. I had my own powerlifting gym, Peach Power Gym. You can look that up. Uh, I taught powerlifting and bodybuilding. And I met, uh, at the time I was um, working at GNC downtown as a, um, I would teach, I would sell weightlifting equipment. I would sell vitamins and things like that. And then there was a store next to me called Mickey Finn's. It was a sporting goods store. And the owners didn't like me working for Mickey Finn's because I was blowing them out of the water for seals on weights and equipment and stuff like that. So they hired me. to. They paid me more money to work for them. But I was more of a bouncer than I was a salesman. So people would come in and steal. And then they would have me, you know, do what I do. And what they would do sometimes is lock the door so the person couldn't get out. And then they throw the guy a beating. I, I didn't feel comfortable doing that unless someone attacked me. So, um, but that's the way that store ran. And then after Mickey Finn's, um, I eventually started, I stopped working there for about a year or two. And then I started doing things out of my basement, teaching people how to lift weights. And then I ended up getting my, I moved out of my basement and I went to Tremont Street from Upton Street to Tremont Street. And we had a, powerlifting bodybuilding gym there and while I was there at Mickey Finn's I, I that's where I met my two other Ketsugu jiu-jitsu teachers and they started teaching jiu-jitsu out of my gym and what I did was they didn't have to pay me rent I'd let them teach there they would charge people money to learn from them but they would teach me and my wife for free and uh, I'd let them rent the, in exchange we do a barter where they could actually teach there for free so the Ketsugu jiu-jitsu was a combat system we didn't do ground fighting and the ground fighting we did, you know, he'd throw you on the ground and have three guys put the boots to you and you had to figure out how to fight three guys from your back or your side or whatever. And that's how our ground fight went. We didn't really wrestle and tap people out. It was more um, life and death type of stuff. So uh, our jujitsu was more of a stand up game. So while I was doing jujitsu back in 85, my teacher, Jim Jones, introduced me to a guy named George Brewster, who was a grandmaster in Filipino martial arts called Arnis. And I started training with my wife and Arnis in Filipino martial arts until Mr. Brewster passed away in 2006. 
In the year 2000, he promoted me to grandmaster in his system and turned the system over to me. And then he went on, you know, and then for six years, he taught me how to be a grandmaster, what I should be doing, how I should better myself, better my students, always keep learning, learn from everywhere. And it was kind of like the Ketsugu, same thing. Ketsugu is like that. You take the best of concepts, principles, and martial science from wherever you can get it, and you apply it to the individual person. So the Anas, uh, I've been doing it ever since, and now I'm the grandmaster of uh, Bruce Duranis. He passed away, Mr. B, in 2006, and I've been teaching Anas ever since, that and Ketsugu Jiu-Jitsu. Very interesting. Else, huh? Very interesting. So from what you, you said, so I'm gathering Kitsugo was a pretty popular on the East Coast because we didn't have it growing up. There wasn't a Kitsugo in Cleveland. I haven't heard of a Kitsugo out here in Chicago. So it's, was it more East Coast centric? What I, what I heard was Kitsugo was popular, I think, in the 50s or the 60s, and then it got banned. You weren't allowed to practice it because Hell's Angels were doing it. And I guess they were wrecking people and I guess it got banned. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's what I heard. There were different Ketsugu people. My guy that taught me, Bob Dickey, learned it in Japan. There was another guy named Harold Brocious who was from Maine. He was a Maine police officer and he was one of the first Navy SEALs. They were called frogmen and he was in the Navy. He was a frogman. And he was, a uh, um, he did, uh, Ketsu, he called it Habro Dojo's Ketsugu Jiu Jitsu. And right now he's, I think he's still alive and he's in California. There was another guy in Illinois named Larry Hilton and he did a Ketsugu Karate, but he also called it Ketsugu Ru Jiu Jitsu. Um, and then there was another Ketsugu system, a Ketsugu Aikido. So Ketsugu is a Japanese word, and it's basically used with food, like chop suey. Oh, so okay. I would tell Japanese people, they said, what do you do? I do Ketsugu Jiu-Jitsu. They would laugh. And I would say, what's so funny? And they said, oh, you only use that term with food. So, hmm. but, but then Mr. Brewster called me one day. You know, I was living here in New Hampshire at the time. And he said, Pete, turn on Channel 2. They're talking about Ketsugu Jiu-Jitsu in World War II. So I turned on channel two, it was a history type thing. And it was the Japanese were teaching the Okinawans Ketsugu to fight the Americans. And they were learning that in um, Okinawa and they had a big program on Ketsugu. And they were showing them how to fight with spears and you know, and how to, how to use different things uh, uh, to fight with. And they were calling it Ketsugu Jiu Jitsu. And I was shocked because I thought my teacher made it up but he said he didn't, he learned it in Japan. So it's a combat of system. It's not a sports system. Um, a lot of the Ketsugu was taught out of YMCAs. It was, they didn't have dojos. So they were basically taught out of YMCAs. They were taught in backyards. They were taught in basements. And that's kind of how, you know, I, I went to the first, Kets, you know, uh, Bob Dickey school was called the Academy of Ketsugu. And he was on Summer Street in Boston, Mass, uh, downtown Boston. He was on the second floor in an old building and I, we used to take the elevator up and down, it was an old elevator. I got stuck between floors and that freaked me out. And I didn't like elevators after that. They had to come uh -huh. get me. I was in that <laughs> damn elevator for a while. And after that, I, 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 it, it, I got this phobia of elevators. I don't like them anymore. Uh -huh. So I'd rather take the stairs, you know? At my age, I, I, I need to take the elevator, but if I could take the stairs, I'm taking the stairs. So that's where I got the phobia of, of out taking an elevator. It was horrible. It was stuck in there. It smelled like pee. And I had to smell <laughs> that shit, you know, all day. Oops, sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, that's all right. All right. Sorry. I don't mean oh, that my mouth doesn't have a filter and it says things I don't want it to say sometimes, you know. Oh, we have to put up with Tony all the time on this <sighs> podcast. We really I love do. Tony. I really like this guy. Tony, I like you. Hey, you're talking to me. <laughs> yeah, talking oh, to you. I like you. You know, it's the funny thing because, you know, being in Cleveland, that's where I was raised. I didn't move to yeah. born and raised. I moved to Chicago in 87. I was already in my early 20s. Um, but Cleveland, technically Ohio's Midwest, but it's not really it where I'm from. We always everything affiliated with the East Coast. New yeah. York, the the you know, the Cleveland mob paid tribute to the New York guys and, and all of that, everything, the rivalries were yep. East Coast. So I never uh I never felt 
and technically geographically we're like 90 miles from the east coast border you know Pennsylvania. Yeah. but uh i thought now i could be wrong now you'll you'll be the guy to answer this there was a now it, it would would this kitsugo be similar to bill underwood's defendo if you knew who bill underwood was the name sounds familiar defendo sounds familiar but i'm not sure okay. what defendo is oh well he's long long gone because when i was a kid he was in his 80s but he did make an appearance on the tonight show with johnny carson and uh oh wow uh, lou ferrigno once uh, i remember that as a kid i don't remember anything else probably it's on somewhere on, on youtube maybe but yeah, he well, was I, a little I guy think- Huh? Yeah, I think it was originally combat, though, right? Like, he, he took out all the offensive parts of it and called it Defendo so he could sell it to the Canadian military. Oh, wow. Oh, is that the same? Oh, okay. Well, Martin was... Mar- oh, well, tell us about it, Martin. Well, th- this is what I remember, because this was, like, one of those things that made its, like, way into Canada and became ingrained as, like, a Canadian martial art. And I think this guy was some kind of uh, similar to uh, what you were describing about um, this whole uh, Ketsugo. It was some kind of a combative martial art that then they adapted for teaching by removing all the objectionable elements, which was, I think, like ripping and hooking and stuff like yeah. that. That's what at least I've, I've read on the Internet. I mean, it was to your point, Tony, by the time this was really popular, this guy was not really actively promoting it anymore. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. So I'm interested to hear m- more about this, Peter. Well, the, the Ketsugu. <clears throat> um, I don't have a sign. I, I teach out of my garage. I pick who I teach. I don't teach everybody. Um, I've had people I refuse, but it seems like a lot of the military people are interested. The, I worked with some guys in ICE. I taught at Fort Devens twice, which they only bring you once, but they had me teach there twice. We have um, different people. They kind of seek me out. We have a guy that owns his own executive protection company and um uh, we did a, a workshop together down in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And what we do is we show you, you know, how to go for the eyes, the nose, the throat, the armpit, the groin, the cyphoid process, how to take out someone's knee, break an arm, how to shatter a bone, bend the fingers back, anything effective. You know, if if I got a pencil, I'm going to use that. Uh, one time I disarmed the guy in Boston with my baseball cap. He pulled a knife on me and... Um, He's holding the knife straight up and down. Now, I've been in knife fights and I've done knife fighting. I had different knife fighting teachers. The guy's holding the knife straight up and down, which you don't do. And I'm thinking to myself, what an amateur. So I grabbed my baseball cap. He let me touch my hat, another amateur. And I hit the knife and the knife went through the hat and I went like that and it went across the street. I didn't even know if that was going to work. I just I just tried it. It was just an idea. And I went, bing, boom. I put my hat back on. I said, now what are you going to do, tough guy? And the guy ran away. And I went across the street and I grabbed the knife and it was a switchblade, but I didn't know how to close it. I didn't know how they worked. I never had one. So I went to the knife store and the guy taught me how to close it. And they cleaned it up for me. That was my first uh, switchblade I ever owned. And, uh, (laughs) but it's, it's, we, we don't, we don't brag. We don't, um, we don't go around telling everybody we're the best because there's no such thing. Uh, we like what we take, what we can from wherever we can get it, and we put it into a jujitsu type format. When I say take what we can get, we take concepts, which are ideas. We take principles, which are the working mechanics of those ideas, and then we phys- you know, figure out the physics behind everything and what works. So the Ketsugu Jiu-Jitsu that I teach, I did not make it up. I made up a teaching method called the Friedman's method. It's a teaching method. It's not a martial art. Everybody thinks I invented Ketsugu Jiu-Jitsu. I didn't. It's been around long before I was born. But what I did invent is an idea on how to teach it. Because when I learned Jiu-Jitsu, we learned what we call Waza. So another guy throws a straight punch and you do a, you get out of the way or you stand in your block and you do all this, go for his throat, his eyes, you rip his arm out, whatever. And... Um, some of the knife fights and baseball bat fights and stick fights that I got into, um, I would meditate and I would say, what's the most important thing? If I had someone that didn't know how to fight, how could I train them to be effective right away without taking years and years and years? And basically, the one thing that I came up with was that saved me in a lot of knife fights and baseball bat fights was footwork. 
So that's that's the, the one thing that I teach. I teach a lot of people how to move their feet. Once they get good at that, then they learn how to move their body, different parts of their body. And then we teach each person that every part of the body defends itself. So if you kick me in the groin, I'm not going to block it. I'm going to move my groin. If you go to stab me in the shoulder, I'm not going to block it. I'm going to move my shoulder. If you go to slash my face, I'm going to lean back. You go to stab, slash my belly, I'm going to pull my hips back. So we have a series of these different things where you teach people how to move and how to do footwork and maintain balance. The next thing is I would teach people situation awareness through these things called nine angles. So we would make an X, a plus, and then the center. And you did, that comes out to nine angles. So we would teach people how to, how to apply, you know, how to do nine angles. One person would back up the other person would do the nine angles and we're training your eyes, how to use wide angle vision instead of peripheral, instead of direct vision, because I come up in, when I got into fights, if you look at somebody and they go to hit you, you're going to get hit before you can think to move. But if you look at them kind of like with your peripheral vision, you could see them moving before they move. And that's what the nine angles does. It teaches situation awareness. It teaches you how to see angles. So if you can't see the angle, you could be the best fighter in the world and someone's going to pipe you. They're going to hit you over the head with a pipe or they're going to put a knife in you or something. But if you can see it before it comes at you, you have a fighting chance. So we would teach people different angles and how to use their eyes and where to look in a fight, not to stare someone in the eyes. I've had people tell me, look your opponent in the eye. If you teach that to someone that doesn't know how to fight and they look someone in the eye, sometimes they can get so afraid that they freeze and they can't defend themselves because they're, they're frozen. So I tell people to look past them, that thousand yard stare, just stare past them and use your peripheral vision. And when they move, you move and just keep your distance. And then after that, you get your eyes sight down, you, you know what to move, you know how to recognize facial um, recognize like, you know, you have little micro exp expressions you, you make with your face, there's body language readings, so, you know, different people have tells. So we teach people how to do that, how to read facial expressions and how to read tells, how to read a mood. You know, if somebody has a bad mood, you could tell they're in a bad mood by the way they walk, the way they talk, the, the, the level of vibration coming out of their voice. So we show them how to do that so they can kind of get a feel for that. Now that takes time. And then the next thing we do, is we teach them anatomy. So they first learn the skeletal system. They learn how to lock up the, 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 you know, the different joints in the anatomy. Then they learn how to break the bones between the joints. So that's called bone shattering. Snapping a joint is bone breaking. Then you got between the joints is bone shattering. So they learn the proper angle of the, uh, the bone, how it's shaped. For example, if you had, a, I don't have a ruler here, but if you had a ruler and you try to hit the edge of the ruler, you probably break your hand. But if you turn it flat, you can snap the ruler, right? Well, your bones are shaped like rulers. So you have to learn how they're shaped. And that tells you what angle to hit the bone to break it. Once you get comfortable with that, then you learn the internal organs. You know, what organ to hit, how to crush someone's windpipe. You know, an eyeball is like jelly. You can put your finger right through it. The ear, if you grab somebody's ear, you can rip it right off. So we just make people aware of these things. And then once you get comfortable with that, then we show you you know, how to use improvised weapons like a pencil or your belt or your scarf and different things like that. And we try to make it practical. Another thing is we have uh, open discussion. So if I'm teaching someone something, um, I want them to call bullshit when they see it. So if they see something that looks ridiculous, um, I want them to tell me, hey, that, that doesn't look like it works. And then that, that promotes discussion. And then from that, I can analyze why they don't get it. And then we can help them understand it. Or maybe I'm explaining it wrong and teach it from a different angle. Because everybody learns differently. Some people are physical people. They got to just hands on. Other people that you can actually talk to them and they learn. Some people can learn just from watching. So you got to figure out how the person learns. And then from there, that takes time. And then from there, you, you figure out a method to teach them. So I teach everybody the same way, the same system, but I teach everybody differently accordingly to who they are. And that takes time. I need to get to know people. But it's, a, it's, um, it's been a long ride. I started when I was like five or six. I'm 63. I'll be 64 in February. And um, I'm still teaching. I love it. I, I, I just love it. I teach the honest on one day and I teach the jujitsu on the other day. And then I get people to come in for privates, 
you know, because they want specific things, you know, they want uh, uh, know, a businessman might want something different than law enforcement. And then you get a guy that comes and he's with, you know, he's no, you know, he's like a, a independent contractor. He used to be a Navy SEAL. He's no longer a SEAL. He works for a company and now he wants to learn a few other things. Or maybe I get some guy that's never done anything in his life, you know, well, you know, I show them how to throw a proper jab, how to use an elbow, how to do some close quarters stuff. We try to keep it practical. There's nothing fancy. And this, what I do isn't for everybody. Cause I get a lot of people, all they care about is a belt. I said, I'll give you a belt right here, white yeah. belt. So, you know, the Jewish belt, it's coming your way. Rabbi Friedman here. <laughs> that, but that's, that's what, um, that's what we do. We just try to teach people how to stay alive, you know, uh, look for options. I tell my students, if you go into a restaurant, look for exits, number one. Number two, look for people's attitudes. Who's the troublemaker in the room? Uh, look for weapons everywhere. Look for imprints. Does somebody have a knife clip? Uh, are they carrying a gun? Do, or how do you know they're carrying a gun? If they got a winter jacket on, I said, they'll keep touching it. They'll keep checking it. You know, everybody checks their weapons to make sure it stays in place. Um, uh, you know your exit. Now, what weapons do you have? You could throw a dish like a Frisbee. Um, I teach people how to throw knives. I teach them how to throw uh, nails, um, forks, butter knives, whatever. You know, it's, now you can throw things. If I got to close quarters, I'm going to throw something. If someone's reaching for a gun and I got a flashlight or I got my keys or whatever, or I got a knife, I'm going to throw it. It may not do a damage to, you know, to, to end it, but it'll get me close to the individual so I can go hands on with them. So it's a very practical system. It's not for everybody. But for the people that do come, they enjoy it. And I teach with humor. I don't, uh, I'm not one of these drill sergeants. I had two DIs here from uh, Paris Island. They were fun. And uh, I had a lot of fun with those guys. But the, um, what we do here is we use comedy. We use a lot of, there's a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. Because when the people leave here, they're smiling, but they're retaining what they're learning. Because when they come here, they're scared to death because they, they see my resume online and they're scared of me. And I don't want anybody to be afraid of me. I don't want people, people to, to fear me. If you fear me, I can't teach you. So what I do is I, you know, I joke around with everybody. I make it fun. And a uh, couple people wanted me to do stand up on a stage. I'm not that type of guy. I don't, I don't do that kind of comedy, but they thought I would do good, you know. Well, I, I can see that you have a little similarity in a way to the Asian martial arts where you use a lot of the foreign words and terminology so for example you said a couple of foreign words like you said and i don't know what this means in english because you weren't speaking english but you said he tried to stick me in the arm and then i grabbed it and i broke his arm and then yeah. i threw it and i put what so we don't know what arm is what's an arm uh, okay well an arm is um uh, usually like a long pole and you can bend it oh and, yeah uh, yeah, there's plenty of arms. There's all kinds of arms. They're everywhere. They're all over your body. There's handles. What Gene okay. LaBelle say, there's handles everywhere, right? So we so all like have arms. Everybody yeah. has arms. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see if I learn. The people who have arms, they're built like rulers, right? Yes. Rulers. <laughs> right. That's okay. the thing is I, my, my R's, there's something wrong with my R's. My daughter was telling my wife one day, she says, um, uh, there was something going on with her car. I can't even pronounce it. Car, car, car. Just make believe I said the R at the end, right? Yeah. So my wife didn't understand her. She goes, what are you talking about? So my daughter goes, you know, there's something wrong with the car. And my wife goes, oh yeah, the guy knows what you're talking about. Now, <laughs> want to hear a true story? My wife is a dental assistant. So she's working for this guy in Manchester, New Hampshire for 14 years. My wife's Chinese, right? So one of the patients comes in and says, oh, you have an accent. So my wife got offended because she worked really hard to get rid of her Chinese accent. So she says to the other co-workers, she goes, do I have an accent? And they said, yeah, you do. You have a very strong accent. So she got, she got offended, my wife. And she goes, I got a Chinese accent? And they said, no, you have a Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That was too funny. Yeah, my, when I first moved up here, none of my students could understand what I was saying. I had, I got to practice. I just can't say that word. Arr, arr. I'm not a pirate. You park the car, Bobby, that kind of shit. Yeah, you know. The Harvard Yard, we'll park the car, have a beer. Yep. yep. It's it, so, Now, Terry, Terry Dow, um, yeah, because yeah, when I've been up in New Hampshire, you do get some people. Yeah. Because it's not far from Mass over there. Um, 
And when I've done a couple seminars in, in Boston, yeah, they talk uh, their thing. But I get it out here because I don't talk like typical Chicago. They think I'm from New York and all. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, that's what's cool about Well, I guess now, Martin, Martin, I want to ask you something. Martin was born in Poland, raised in Poland. Do Now, I, I was told that Polish have the accents like, like we have here, like Southern accents and shit, correct? Yeah, there is accents that I can't understand, but you know, I haven't <laughs> been regularly visiting Poland, so I don't keep up. Yeah, I got, I got um, a couple of nephews and a niece that are Polish. Good people, <clears throat> strong stock. My nephew's like 6'6". Six, six. Uh, he, he, a couple of guys, he's like, he should be in the circus, my nephew. He had like four guys, he drove a little car and he had four guys come up behind him and they're beeping. <clears throat> so they get out of the cars, they were going to beat him up. So he's like 350 pounds. He gets out of the car and uh, they saw that and they all jumped in the car and then they tried to get away and he picked up the back of the car and they were spinning the tires. He's like a, uh -huh. he's like Andre the Giant for Christ's sakes. Unreal. Well, your martial art background sounds similar to, well, not the background itself, but the style of fighting. Like what, 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 what I teach, what we do is basically everything, you know, uh, and it's, it's, it's highly scientific, uh, as yep. far as no rules, um, yep, no rules. Right. And you know, uh, it, it can be, uh, as you said, it's not for everybody. And that's the case with me. You know, I, I, I've, I've trained a lot of the the grappler guys that want to come through and they find out, yeah, this isn't what Tony teaches. Is not really for me? I want to learn um, just like sport. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's their thing. Yeah. Not wrong with that. Um, no, yeah. no, no, no. That's what makes it great. I mean, we're all, we're all so different. Um, but yeah, I wish I would have, I used to do seminars about once a year up there, you know, in New Hampshire at, um, at Terry's place, you know. Uh, well, if you go back up there, let me know. I'll let you twist me up like a pretzel. You can teach <laughs> me some things. I'm open well, to learn from anybody. I, I I can always learn more. I can always better, you know, I can learn what you do, and it'll help me with what I do. So Yeah, we'll see what happens next year. I haven't been able to travel for many years because of, of taking care of my mom, but she's yep. no longer, she's in a nursing home now. So we'll see because Terry has those big symposiums, the, symposiums. I think, in March. I was teaching there for I don't know how many years. And then I, a couple of years ago, I just, I didn't want to do it anymore because when I first started teaching there, I got a lot of people. Like I said, what I do isn't for everybody. Yeah. And I got a lot of people and they kind of, the stuff I was teaching, some of the, you know, some of the people like, don't teach that. Don't teach yeah. that. And I'm saying, well, you insert your knife here and you slide it all the way across, you rip it up. And they're like, don't teach that. So, but what happened was, I'd start, I'd get 30, 40 people training with me. And then as the years went by, I end up with like two people until eventually I'm near twirling my thumbs and no one shows up in my corner. And I, and then I, and you know, all the famous teachers, the, the, you know, the guys with the big names, they had all the, all the people and I, and they deserve it. You know, they're out there, they're plugging, they're, they're promoting, they're doing their thing. And I, and I enjoy listening to those guys too. I go over and I shoot the shit with them and I have a lot of fun with them. But um, it got to the point where I started feeling bad. I'm like, you know, I, I'm making time taken away from my family. I could be teaching people, but I guess what I was doing, it wasn't, um, it wasn't on the plate. You know, it wasn't on the menu of what they wanted to learn. Hey, you poke your fingernail. Guy goes to shoot in, take your thumb, put it in his eye socket, grab the back of his head and just twist it in his eye or rip his ear out. If he gets you, you know, in a front bear hug, bite him on the neck and open up the carotid artery in his neck. They don't want to hear stuff like that. And I'd bite people, you know, every now and then. And my teacher, Mr. Brewster would bite your thumb. If you're holding the stick like that, he would bite your thumb. He'd always say, wrap your, your, your thumb around the stick. Don't do that. Yeah. He bit my thumb. He bit my wife's thumb. He would bite other people's thumbs. New people would try out honest class and they go, what's wrong with him? He bit me in the thumb. <laughs> I still keep your thumb up there because you're going to get it broke. And uh, so uh, he was amazing. You would have liked him. He's a World War II veteran, stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. And he said when he was pulling up on that craft, when that thing went down, everybody's head in front of him was exploding from the eight millimeter machine guns that the, the Germans were using. He had to step over his friend's bodies, jump into the water and run to the beach. And he said, half the guys drowned because the guys driving the boats that, that delivered them to the beach 
were scared because they didn't want to get killed. So they dropped them off too far into the water and they yeah. had ammo, they had backpacks and they would, they would sink and they would drown. So we lost a lot of people just drowning. He blew up the gas tanks to the battle of the bulge. He helped Pat and built the, those, what do you call those bridges to drive the tanks over. And he also liberated the camp, the uh, concentration camps. My uncle actually had tattoos on his arm of numbers. He was in those camps. And he told me, he said, don't, don't ever let them take your guns because that's what they do. First, they come around and they blame you. Then they take everybody's guns and then they come and they round you up. They put you in a camp. They killed my, um, a lot of my relatives in those camps. Um, they, he said they lined them up and they shot them with machine guns. And then they just made a big hole and threw them all in the hole, covered them with lime and dirt. And that was it. So he ended up surviving that. And my teacher, Mr. Bruce, deliberated those camps, which is, you know, some of those camps. It was horrible. But the story my uncle told me was made me so angry, you know. So I, hopefully we won't let that happen again here in this country. He told me, he said it can happen here in America. He said, we may have beat the German army, but we didn't beat the Nazism because they took a lot of them back to U.S. He saw them take these people back like the Americans would come in and take these uh, guys and, and I don't know what they did with them. But they, well, my wrestling coach was a um, a survivor of Bergen Belsen, so uh, he lived it. And uh, mm. now I was raised by my grandfather and grandmother. He was a World War II veteran, but Pacific Theater. Yep. So there mm. were a lot. Now it's ironic because my grandfather did have a Japanese American friend um, who fought in World War II for the Americans. Yeah. But. Well, my grandfather was not a fan of the uh, of martial arts because number one, he thought it was he was a professional boxer too, like your dad. Yep. So he <clears> said, <throat> you know, it's it's not effective. Number one, and he just had a. Uh, I mean, he, I'm talking karate now, not oh, yeah. the grappling aspect of it. And then he didn't like. Uh, he just had resentment um, with what they went through in 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 the Pacific. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Guess, so my, my father didn't like it either. Yeah, it's it's rough. You know, we didn't live it. You and I didn't go through that. So we no. can't walk in their shoes. No. You know, um, but, and then we had a plumber, Mr. Scully, again, a World War II guy. He was actually in a PO, American, uh, in, in a German POW camp, but he never talked about it. So I, I, I have no stories, but he was, uh, well, he was already in his late 60s or 70 when I knew him, but he was still a rough customer. You know, he didn't take shit from nobody. Um, but yeah, it's interesting times. Um, so the thing with now Terry Dow, who I want to get on the podcast as well, you know, he's inherited. You talked about you're the grandmaster now of the Arnese and Terry inherited um, Bill, Bill Wallace's Wallace. yep. yeah, Superfoot Systems. Yeah. So we'll have Terry on hopefully soon. Terry is good. Discuss I mean, all I, of that. I'll tell I'm, you, I wouldn't want to get kicked by Terry. He's really good. Yeah, he's really good. Uh, yeah. Terry, and he was at Waco. He was part of the uh, world, you know, the American Karate yeah. World Championship team, uh, you know, 25 years ago or whatever it was. But, uh, yeah, he's an interesting guy. But it's a shame that I never got to meet you because I used to go out there. I, I, met well, I wish I met you too. He told me about you a, a while ago, and I wanted to meet you too because I was yeah. always interested in, what is it, catch wrestling and shoot yeah. fighting. and But I never met anyone that ever taught that. You know, I I'll heard a lot up of good you. things. Yeah, I heard a lot of good things about catch wrestling. Yeah. Well, if I ever make it out there, even if it's just to go, just to go myself. I'll buy you lunch. Yeah. I'll buy you breakfast and lunch. You come there, out. There you I'll go. buy you breakfast and lunch. Yeah. And, and yeah. We'll, we'll talk and we'll trade stories. I got a lot of them. You, I just would, don't want to bore you. I, I had a guy. This is a true story. I shouldn't tell it because I'm putting it in a book. <laughs> I'm writing a oh. book on how I got into edge weapons, but I'll let the cat out of the bag. I used to own a power lifting and bodybuilding gym. So I was on my way going to the gym and I saw this guy in a suit, a tie, but his tie was hanging down. His suit was dirty. His shoes were all scuffed up. He needed a shave. His hair was a mess and he's holding a knife. And I walked by him. <clears throat> this is a true story. And he says to me, Hey, you. So I, I turn and I look at him. He's a Caucasian guy. And he says, uh, give me your money. And he's showing me the knife. So I, I asked him, I said, why? He goes, you know, he goes, I'm robbing you. Give me your money. 
And I said, why do you need my money? Why, why do you need it? And he's going, he goes, I got a knife. I said, yeah, I can see that. But, you know, how much do you need? He says, just give me all your money. I said, what if it's not enough? <laughs> he goes, what, what do you mean if it's not enough? I said, well, I need to know how much you need because we may have to go to the bank and get more, right? <laughs> so this is, we're, we're talking, now people are walking by while we're having a discussion, right? And no, and he's, and the guy's holding the knife and he's telling me that he's robbing me with the knife and I'm questioning him. I'm not upset or I'm not angry. I'm not scared or anything because I, 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 I can move. I got footwork, right? Plus I got a handgun on me and I got a couple of blades on me. He doesn't know that. So I'm talking to him and I says, well, what do you need the money for? You know, what, what do you want it for? And he's, I could see he was down and out and he's looking around. He's scared, the knife shaking. And the more I would ask him, the more he would shake. And this was happening right in front of a place called Today's Bread. They make bread and you could smell the bread, right? <clears throat> so delicious. They also have a rotisserie chicken there and they mm. grow their own vegetables. So they make sandwiches on their bread. So I said to the guy, you know, we we're talking, I says, well, how much do you need, buddy? And he's like, I just need all your money. And I'm going, yeah, but what if it's not enough? We got to go to the, the bank and get more. What do you need? And he wouldn't tell me. He said, just give me all your money. All of a sudden, I heard his stomach growl really loud. And then he, he grabbed his stomach. And I said, time out. I said, let's put this on hold. Let's go in this store here. I'll buy you a rotisserie chicken. They make their own mayonnaise. They cut up the lettuce, the tomatoes, and his stomach's growing more. And I can mm. see it's affecting him, right? And he's going, oh. So I says, we'll come in here. They get nice rotisserie chicken. It's so, you know, it's flavor. They, they, I don't know what they put on there, but it tastes really good. You can get a soda. I'll get you some chips. Come on, I'm hungry. You hungry? I'm hungry. You hungry? Let's go in. So he goes, okay. I said, put the knife away. We'll come back after we eat. And we'll start over. So he goes, okay. So he puts the knife away. We go in and I tell him, you know, you want to get that sandwich. You know, it's got the soft bread on the inside, the crusty on the outside with the mayonnaise, the chicken. So he orders it. We both sit down at a table and we're eating and we're drinking and we're quiet. And finally I look at him and I said, what's your story? Tell me your story. He goes, what do you mean? I said, how did you become homeless? He goes, how do you know I'm homeless? I said, look at you. And I said, whatever, you know, if I was you, uh, I would give up this job you're doing right now, holding people up because you suck at it. You need to find another job. So he's like, well, you're my first customer, you know, my first. Uh, I said, yeah, I can tell. So I said, well, well, how did you how did this happen? He said, well, I used to be a big CEO of a big company and my boss that was above me didn't like me. You know, so we didn't get along. He didn't like me. So I had this idea that I wanted to implement, but I didn't want to let him know because I know he would steal the idea. So he was telling a friend and the friend told the boss, the boss went to the big people, implemented the idea and they made millions, right? So the boss got a big uh, bonus plus, you know, he looked good. And then he went up to the boss and he said, that was my idea. You know, I want my, my bonus. And the boss told him, go back to your desk. So then he went above the boss to talk to the, the higher ups and they got mad and they fired him because the boss told him that he was a problem and he was going to do that and lie. So they fired him. So now not only did they fire him, but they sent out a memo so he couldn't get a job in that field anymore. So the guy ended up losing his house. He lost his wife and kids and he ended up in the street. They repoed his cars. He had no money. So I said, are you willing to work? He goes, yes, of course. I said, okay, give me the number to the Pine Street Inn. That's like a shelter where he was staying. And I said, I'm going to, I know a guy that might be able to get you a job. So I, I, he wrote down his name. He wrote down the number to the Pine Street Inn on a piece of paper. I think it was a napkin. I put it in my pocket. We get done eating. So I pull out a $50 bill and I give it to him. And he's going, no, no, I can't take that. You've been more kind. You bought me food. I said, no, no, take it. It's yours. I said, this guy's going to call you. So then he leaves. I go back to the gym. As soon as I walk around the counter to take over, the guy walks in that I wanted to see. And I said, hey, uh, I need to talk to you for a minute. See this guy? I need you to give him a job. He goes, OK, uh, who is he? I said, well, I started telling him he was homeless and all that. So then he took care of it. So a few weeks goes by and I forgot about it. And I saw the guy uh, that I my friend and I said, hey, did you? get that guy a job. Did, was he, he said, yeah, we got him in the union. 
I said, you did. He said, yeah, but I had to buy him a new suit. I had to get him a shave and all this. And um, so we, we, we got him in, he's in the union. About three, four months goes by, maybe five. I don't know. I, I can't remember. It was a while ago. It was back in the eighties. The guy comes into my gym and he looks good. You know, he's all dressed up. He's clean shaven. and he yeah. looks like a different person. So he comes over to me and he says, I just want to thank you um, for helping me out. He puts the $50 bill back on the counter. He said, I want to repay you. He hugs me, starts crying and he kisses me on the cheek and I'm looking around. I'm not that kind of guy here. So he's, he's, he kisses me on the cheek and he thanks me. And then I said, Oh, no problem, buddy. And he goes, and thank you for not killing me. I said, what? He goes, yeah, I, I, I heard you could kill me. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the guy that got me the job, your buddy asked me how we met. So I told him I tried to hold you up. And he said, Pete could have killed you if he wanted to. So he says, I want to thank you for not killing me. And um, the guy, when he told the guy what happened, he said, that's Pete. He does shit like that all the time. Wow. <laughs> so, but that was a, that's a true story. I'm putting that in a book I'm writing on uh, edge weapons and how I got involved in edge weapons and things like that. But uh, not the, the point I was making is not everybody needs to be killed or crippled. You know, you, you got to be able to read people. You got to be able to feel the vibe to know who you're, who's across from you and be able to tell whether or not, you know, they're worthy of your knowledge or if they're, they're going to get something else. You can't just fight everybody. And I try to instill that in my students. You never know the other person's story. Watch your back, be nice, but be ready to kill them <laughs> as you're being nice. And, um, and just, you know, not everybody's, you know, a bad person, you know, but uh, be ready to do, you know, handle your business if need be. That's a classic example of in psychology, they would call it cognitive dissonance because this guy, you did not act the way he for sure thought you were going to act. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was completely opposite. And you disarmed him, you know, metaphorically uh, that way. Now, Martin, you look like you have some questions here. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, we always talk about uh, having some level of athleticism while practicing martial arts. And you've mentioned your powerlifting um, gym and experience. Can you talk about a little, if, if that helped or, you know, how yeah. it kind of meshed together with your martial arts training? Well, the discipline that I got out of martial arts, um, it helped me with, I was a powerlifter, not a bodybuilder. So at one time I could bench press 505 pounds for five easy reps up and down and my fifth rep would go up easy. So I could probably get more. Um, you had a question? Yeah, was that with a weightlifting jacket? <laughs> <laughs> you like the Pete's Power Gym jacket? I should get you one, mail it out to you. Well, but I was actually talking more about the, you know, how they have sometimes these uh, really uh, jean jackets which help you with, with bench press. Oh, bench press and shirt, the, yeah. I never yeah, used one. Shirt. I never use the benching shirt, but a lot of people do use it. And it takes two or three people to help you put it on. I don't know if you know about that. And once it's on, you better bench quick because you're not going to be able to breathe. Yeah, you walk and, like this. No, it, it, it pulls your shoulders forwards. Yep. And, and, you're like, and, and you're like this. I, I just, I, I never cared for that. I believe the natural strength. Uh, I did a 505 pound branch. I could take 600 pounds off the rack and do these little quarter reps. I used to do 385 behind the neck for repetitions, touching the back of my neck to lock out. I'd get six to eight reps. I could curl 350 pounds, you know, where you swing it up and you let it down slow. I was doing a 600 pound deadlift for 20 repetitions. And I got into a beef. Uh, I had two guys try to rob me downtown Boston um, on Tremont Street uh, near Park, was it Park Street? Anyways, I came out of the train station and these two two guys, they were taller than me. And I had on a puffy jacket. Remember those jackets? They, they were like puffy and they had squares. Uh, I know. Do. Yeah, so I would zip that up and I, I it was me, but it looked like it was the jacket because I, you know, I was big, right? So these two guys try, hold me up and this guy grabs my shoulder, slaps my shoulder. And here's where powerlifting really pays off. He slapped my shoulder and said, give me your money. And the other guy looked like he was wanting to throw hands. So I did a back uh, raking fist on his forearm. I knocked his arm off my shirt, off my, my shoulder. 
Then I stepped in and I hit him with an uppercut, caught him in the ribs. I broke his ribs. I heard him breathe out like, like wheeze. He went up in the air over a car hood and landed on the other side. And a yellow Boston cab almost hit him and had a swerve not to hit him. Now he didn't move anymore. Then I turned to his friend. I said, come on, let's go. Let's throw hands. And he just, he took off. He said, we only asked you for some change. All of a sudden, everybody was clapping. You know, there was a crowd of people. And I, and I looked at them and they said, those guys were robbing everybody. Everybody here, they were threatening everybody. So that was one <coughs> time that the power lifting really helped out a lot. Another time I got into a grappling match with one of my jujitsu teachers and he started to get a little rough with me, you know, like really uh, almost like he's going to injure me. So what I did was I grabbed his chest and his pelvic and I, I threw him up like in pro wrestling and he must've went about five feet in the year. He was like 190 pounds. That was like nothing for him. I just threw him right in the air and he went back and he goes, damn, you're strong. <laughs> he couldn't, he couldn't get me. So power lifting uh, is actually healthy. It strengthens your bones. It strengthens your tendons and your ligaments. It only slows you down if you don't work out. If you don't throw hands and you're just lifting, of course you're not going to be coordinated. Of course you're not going to uh, be fast. But if you're if you're um, working out and you're still doing your martial arts, look at Michael J. White. Look at the size on that guy. The the actor. Um, that guy yeah. can move. Uh, look at that other guy. Uh, for, I don't know if he's Australian. Uh, what the hell's his name? He does backflips. Um, uh, oh, what the hell? I can't think of his name, but he's got quite the body on him too. And these guys can do all kinds of flips and things like that. So the only time weightlifting will hurt you is if you, you don't do your martial arts with it. Uh, as far as choke holds, you're not going to be able to, you know, sink your arm in as a skinnier arm is better for choke holds than a big arm because the, the smaller the arm, the better the choke hold. You know, the, if you're into that, if that's what you're going for, I teach people you can choke someone with two fingers, just pinch off the artery in their neck and wait for them to pass out. You don't need to get your arm around their, their neck. But the power lift in it, it, you know, if somebody would punch me or kick me to the chest, it, it was like a, wearing a, a, you know how they, they have like the padded um, chest protectors? It felt like that. I really didn't get hurt. You can kick me to the stomach, punch me to the chest. It was like armor. You know, you can hit me in the shoulder and it was like armor. And um, I think it's healthy. And, and the older you get, the more you should lift weights because it, it strengthens your bones and it helps you with your tendons and ligaments. And it pumps your blood through your, your arteries and your veins, which keep them dilated. If you sit around and you don't work out, your veins, and they start to constrict. And then you start having problems with your veins and your arteries. So I got a full gym in my basement uh, right now. I, I always had a gym everywhere I lived. I've always had a gym and I got to start using it. It's like uh, holding clothes and dust right now, but I got to go down there and dust everything up. I was training with my son-in-law with the weights and then COVID came out and everyone got sick and we just kind of stopped for a while. But Monday I'm going to start working with him on jujitsu because I uh, he does all the filming. He's the computer guy, the phone guy. I was always a flip phone guy. And then, and then they had, they gave me, look at this, this is what they gave me. One of these things. I, I didn't even know how to turn it on and off at the time. He had to show me, I was typing in 40 people's phone numbers and I ended up calling 40 people and they're all calling me back. You know, what do you want? I said, I don't want you. I, it's, you called me. No, I'm typing your name and it's an iPhone. I heard they have that problem. You put ah. their name in and it calls them. And even if you don't want to call them, it calls them. You know, sometimes I call people. I don't even know who I'm talking to. <laughs> and I mean, on this, Joe, you use an iPhone, don't you, Joe? Yeah. yeah, you you could actually video phone people. Like there's a video on here, and you could see them. Why it's pretty cool. I mean, I like it now. I didn't like it in the beginning, but I'm learning more about it. Same thing with the computer. My my son-in-law does all this, and he's teaching me more about the computer. So hopefully I can do one of these one time. I don't even know how you figure the podcast out. To... You know, they have these things now too, Peter. You may not be aware. They fly in the air and they yep. carry people. So like they call them airplanes. I never so, heard of that. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that you're not aware of. Where do you find of. these people? Where do you find these airplanes? Well, they're not. Well, you know, they're around, but you got to know the right people. Okay. It's all, you know. I got a guy here. Know. He's the right people. I, I know this guy. He's my student. He flies for a place called JetBlue. 
Would that help? He's a pilot. He was supposed yeah, to. Teach, that'll... He was going to teach me how to fly uh, helicopters, but uh, he said you got to be able to control that little stick there because you can crash it. So he wouldn't take me on the helicopter. I had one time the special forces wanted me to go with them on a helicopter with the door open and fly really fast and then slide down on a rope. I told him, get lost. I'm not doing that. I'm not getting on a, on a helicopter and jumping out on a rope. And they wanted to shoot guns, you know, from the helicopter. They have targets on the ground and they fly by and you shoot at them. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Screw yeah. that stuff. So um, they wanted me to do the, uh, the, the other thing too. My gym, back to my gym, my gym, I basically took kids off the street and I taught them powerlifting, bodybuilding, uh, body toning. I taught them nutrition and anatomy. And I sponsored them. And I made 35 national champions out of that gym, all drug free, no steroids, no growth hormones. The name of my gym was called Peach Power Gym. It was all natural. Anybody on steroids, they weren't allowed to train in the gym. But if you're trying to get off steroids, you're a big guy and you want to quit, you're welcome to train in the gym, but you can't take any steroids. And I had a it was a truth thing. Not everybody told the truth. You know, there's yeah. guys, they would shoot up at home, but they were still pumping iron. And eventually, if I found out, I'd ask them to leave. There's a couple of guys I actually had to throw out of the gym. But our gym was, uh, um, it was more of a, um, I was trying to get the kids off the street and do for them what nobody did for me. So I had a lot of trouble kids. And once you start teaching them how to lift weights, and I would hand them books, I said, if you want to get really big and really strong, learn anatomy. And I would go over all the muscles. Okay, this is the bicep. Bi means two. The bicep contracts, the arm closes. Back here's the tricep. Three, that means three. The tricep is an extension muscle. So that, that contracts, your arm opens up, your bicep contracts, your arm closes. The deltoids, the interior, the lateral, the posterior. Interior does this, lateral does that, posterior comes back. So then later, when they learned that, they learned bodybuilding. And then I show them, if you hit the belly of any muscle with a knuckle, they're not going to be able to use that muscle because it's going to cramp up and constrict. So we would do the interior, the lateral, and the posterior. So someone slashes with a knife, you knuckle them right into the rear deltoid, and it cramps up on them. Or you hit them in the lateral deltoid. And so they would learn anatomy. And then I'd show them how to box, how to do a little bit of uh, street rest. We called it street wrestling. Because you wrestle on pavement, you cut up your elbows, your knees, <laughs> you whack your head on the ground, you roll on dog shit. That was the worst. And then there'd be broken glass and rocks. But that's how I would train them. We take them out into the alley and show them how to do street wrestling. Couple of you know cheat things, you know how to punch someone in the groin or whack somebody in the nerve on the side of the knee, different things like that. So we were teaching them to be better street fighters, and um, we also had a program where if you brought in your report card and you can improve the grades you got a free peach power gym jacket i must have gave away about 40 jackets and a lot of the teachers in the schools would call me wanting to know who i was because all of a sudden the kids would go into the teachers and say how can i improve my grades because they all wanted a peach power gym jacket you know it was pretty cool and then i'd have the pro wrestlers come in like john studd killer kowalski and they would sign autographs and take pictures with the kids i had anthony michael hall there one year um, he came in, he was signing autographs. One time we had a line of women around the block. We had to lock the doors because I had the chip and deal dancers there. You know, the guys, they take their clothes off and they wiggle on stage. You're, you're talking Joe's talk now. Joe knows that shit. Oh, you know that? Yeah. they Joe, you used to be a chip and deal? Yeah. Yeah. They keep me on, on standby just in case one of the dancers can't make it. So I'm a backup dancer. Yeah, you look like you're you can be a dancer. I thought that when I looked at you. I see he's one of the Chippendale guys. The only this would problem probably be a good time to plug my other YouTube channel, but I'll wait. I don't want to Okay. You know, the, the Chippendales, I found out one thing. I'd say, guys, you know, you got a a, a line of women out there. And they're going, Oh, we don't care. I'm going, what do you mean you don't care? We don't like women. Uh oh. What do you mean you don't like women? Ooh. So then I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then it hit me. Okay. So, but that's how they got to look so good. You know, they take care of their bodies. They look handsome, you know, and I saw, okay. But they would come in and we'd have to lock the door because the women would come in and, and just, you know, crowd them, you know, hug them and want autographs and things like that. And they weren't interested in the women, but they asked me not to say nothing because that's how they make their money. 
you know, they go on stage and they wiggle. I don't know how they do it. I, I never went there and watched them, but you know, we, we had a guy, we had two guys from another country. I don't know what country, but they had a weird accent. So they come in and they say, Peter, um, we're going out to an American club and we like to learn, you know, the, the American dance. I said, let, let me show these guys were like a pain in the ass. They bothered everybody in the gym. Right. So I said, come here, I'm going to show you this dance. What you're going to do is you're going to lift one shoulder and roll it back, then lift the other shoulder, then go back and forth like that. Now I had them doing this for 10 minutes. And then I said, okay, now the next thing you're going to do is go like this with your thumbs and go like that. Right. <laughs> and then they did that. And I said, the next thing you're going to do, you're going to look at all the pretty women and you're going to point and you're going to wink like that. And they, so they're going like this and then they, they'd go like that and they'd wink and they wink and, and then they left. Right. So a week later, I had one, of, I had a couple of guys that were bouncers in the club. They come in the club and they said, what did you teach those guys? I said, I showed them my TV dance. That's the dance I do in front of the TV in my underwear when no one's around. So they said, you're not going to believe it. These guys got out into the middle of the floor. These two guys, these pain in the asses. I hope they don't watch your podcast. These guys. <laughs> Anyways, a lot of pain in the asses. Yeah, but uh, yeah, maybe so, those pain in the asses. Yeah, they're pain in the ass. So they're they're doing the, the the thing and they're pointing at the women. They had all kinds of women dancing with them and giving them the phone numbers, right? So a couple of days later, the guys come in. And I said, hi, guys. And they said, hey, we really like the way you taught us the new dance. Plenty <laughs> of chicks. And I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> wow. I was goofing on them. And they ended up getting a lot of phone numbers and thanking me for the dance. And the bouncers proved it. They came in and said they actually did that stupid dance. And the music was playing. It went to the music. And everybody surrounded them and started copying them and do that dance. I should have marketed that dance. I could have been rich. <laughs> yeah. Why? What, what, what's what's wrong with me? I don't know. Anyway, let, that... let me because we're running short here on time. But let me ask you a serious question. Do okay. you know or have you met Ted Arcidi? Yeah, he used to work out at my gym. Oh, yeah. He came down into my basement gym. He was studying to be a dentist. Can you imagine him pulling your teeth? Wow. So he would come down and he'd work out. And it was one of those machines where you got to put the weight on and there's no bearings. So he's working out and he's getting pissed. He's going, how much is on that machine? I said, there's 300 pounds there, Ted. He's going, that ain't 300 pounds. That's heavier. I know what 300 pounds is. I said, no, that's only 300 pounds. The machine would scrape because all it was was a couple of poles, you know, a couple of pipes against the pole. <laughs> yeah. So it's resistance. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I, I knew Ted. And then he, he moved up here to New Hampshire after he went to dental school and I stayed in Boston. Then I moved up here. And then one of my students brought me to his place. He sells uh, cardio equipment now. And that wow. he lost a lot of weight because uh, he tried to do wrestling. He had no cardio. So he got involved with cardio and he dropped a lot of weight. He looks good. I haven't seen him since. But um, yeah, I knew Ted. Yeah, he was a strong guy. For those of you who don't know, he was over 700 pounds on the bench. So, 705 yeah. or seven something on the bench. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was a stud. I mean... I saw him. I never met him. So like he's now I could be completely wrong, but when I was doing a seminar out there, I thought his gym was, there was like a bridge or it was by water. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. Yeah. Right. So Terry and I were across the street and I saw, I saw him walking. I didn't know what it was. And Terry's like, that's Ted Arcini going into the gym. I'm like, well, let's, let's go talk to him. He's like, no, Terry's like, no, you, we got to get back. You got some privates to do. I'm like, good enough. So I didn't really meet him, but I, I saw him from across the street. But yeah, yeah interesting he, man. Yeah, he used to work out at my gym, uh, my basement gym, uh, when I was in, in Boston on Tremont. No, I mean, on Upton Street. I had a gym. I, it's where I started in my basement. My, mother's, my mother and father owned the brownstone. It was like five floors. And then we had a basement. I was like the sixth floor down below. And I had, I, <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk on your podcast how I got my equipment because uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll have to meet in person. I'll tell you that. But anyways, we made a lot of my own weightlifting equipment and it was crude and it was welded, really good welded. But whatever you put on the machines, whatever we had, it was heavier than what you put on. And so I would tell someone put a 25 pound plate. Oh, it's only 25 pounds. It was like 60. 
<laughs> yeah, because of the resistance and shit. Yeah. Yeah. So then we ended up putting grease, and everybody had grease all over them. <laughs> they leave the gym. Their face had grease. Their arm, their clothes, their gym. Oh man, the stories I could tell you that we should have been training gym, John Travolta. Yeah, well, that would have been nice if he yeah, came. Grease, no, I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know who I did have come down? Paul Gleason. Did you ever hear of him? Oh, yeah. Well, he was in, he was like, he passed away, I think, correct? Oh, wow. Yeah. I, he was I in the movie he, Die Hard. He was the guy that, that says, oh, no, it looks like we're going to need more FBI guys. Exactly. He the picture for yeah, me. He passed away. He you was also in Trading Places. He was yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, secret guy, you know, the private detective and shit. He was funny. He's, yeah. He came in the gym. And I said, gee, you look familiar. He says, come on, I know you. And I said, you do? And he started shooting the shit with me like he knew me. And then he knew things about me that uh, I'm saying, how does he know these things? And then what he would do is he'd walk away and then he'd come back and act like he'd know, say more things. So then um, I found out he, he was the actor. I said, you're in Die Hard. You're Paul Glee. Yeah, that's me. He goes, who's that guy over there? I said, that's Bob Miller. They just had a, a, a cookout three weeks ago. And he says, tell me all about him. You know, he plays guitar. He does this. He gets into wrestling. He says, I right, watch this. So he goes over and he looks at Bob and he does like a three take. And he goes, Bob. And Bob goes, yeah. He goes, don't you remember me? I was at your cookout three weeks ago. We shoot the <laughs> shit. And Bob's like, I don't remember you. He says, yeah. And he starts telling Bob all this stuff about himself that no one knows. But I told him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then he walks away and Bob comes up to me. Who's that guy? I said, I don't know. He said he knew you, right? So then Bob walks away. He's confused. Then another guy comes up. He comes up to me and he says, who's that guy? Paul Gleason says, who's that guy? So I start telling him. So we went to everybody in the gym and he went to everybody in the gym and everybody was want, coming up to me. Who's that guy? You know, I said, oh, that's that. And then finally he let the cat out of the bag and everybody had a good laugh. The, uh, my gym, um, it'd be packed nine o'clock at night. The phone would ring. Hello, Pete's Power Jim. Pete Freeman talking. Uh, yeah, I'd like to find out information about you, Jim. Sure. Uh, we tell him how many days, the hours, how much. And then the guy goes, um, what are you wearing? I said, what am I wearing? Well, you can wear pants, sweatpants. No, he goes, what are you wearing? I said, well, I got some sweatpants on, a T-shirt. What are you wearing under the pants? I said, hold oh, on. You want, you want Bob. Hold on. Hey, Bob. <laughs> Bob, what the Bob? I said, some guy just called and asked for you. <laughs> I can't. Bob's talking, he's like, you, Bob starts swearing and hitting the phone. He goes, what the hell? And he hangs up. He goes, who's that guy? So I don't know. He called asking for you. The guy calls back. Hello? I said, hello, Pete's Power Gym. What are you wearing? Hold on. Hey, Lenny, come over here. <laughs> I, I love it. I would have fit right in. <laughs> my gym was like Seinfeld. When I saw Seinfeld, I said, that's my gym. It was just like that. People, there was always comedy around my gym. It was really, really funny. I, I had um, uh, who's the other guy? John Wooten. You remember him, the no. strong man? He held the planes back. He stopped the, the gate from closing down at Guatemala. You know where they have that gate? Uh, what the hell's the name of that gate? He stopped that from closing. He would hold the airplanes back. He was a uh, uh, John Wooten, world strong man. He yeah, would I'm work out of my him. gym. Yeah, and he would leave his business card. So people would contact him and stuff. He's telling me he's writing a movie and he wants to put me in his movie and what a con artist he was, but I like him. He was a good guy. I don't know if he's still alive too, but he was a strong, he would lie down on a bed of nails and have you drive a motorcycle over him or drive a truck over him. He did all kinds of things. He would bend bars. He, he was a, like a, he was also a, a black belt in Aiki Jitsu and okay. Jiu Jitsu. So he's yeah. a, you know, and he was for real. He, he did, um, I think Michael Deepa Squally might know him because he may have trained with Michael too. I met Michael. Yeah, Michael D. I I I met Michael's father, and um, I thought he was an amazing jujitsu guy. Uh, Michael Senior, his father. Yeah, he was a good jujitsu man. His stuff worked. He he had those big ass hands, and he slapped you and be all well, over. Terry, I think, started out with Michael Deepa yeah. Squally or something. Well, he's still he's still with them. Oh, okay. Michael keeps trying to get me to come to his uh, his stuntman school. He wants to throw me off a roof into a bag, an airbag. I, mean, I ain't doing that. I'm not going to go on a roof jump into an airbag. I don't want to be a stuntman, you know? Yeah, yeah. But he keeps trying to get me to come to New Jersey to be a stuntman. I'm like, yeah, I'm not into that. Well, I guess looking at the clock on the wall, we've, we've gone over time today, but we've got to wrap this show up. This was one of the most interesting ones. Wouldn't you say, Joe? 
Yeah, highly entertaining. And I, I get the yep. feeling we could go for a few hours here, man. Well, I, we got to have you back on, Peter, for yeah. sure. Well, I'll tell you, if you come up, you can put bend me like a pretzel. We'll take pictures of you locking me up and beating the crap out of me. And I'll treat you to breakfast or, or lunch. And we'll have you, if I, if I bend you into a pretzel, I'll have your wife pour mustard all over you. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Pretzel, there you, know, you go. We'll have Lenny. Get Lenny. He likes yeah, to wear we women's clothing, you know. <laughs> but, but anyway, all right, guys, I will see you, everybody, uh, next week. Now, every, let me make an announcement about next week. Okay. Tentatively, we're, Joe's lining up a very special guest that's important to me because it's not going to be martial art related. It's going to be music related. Wow. And we're going to have a world champion, believe it or not, a world champion musician on. Next week, if all goes well, uh, you know, would have been, he's playing a gig this weekend, actually, in Milwaukee. So you never know, but let's hope for it. But we will get Mr. Friedman back on here. Definitely. For, for sure. It would be great to see you again. And, and yeah. in, in the meantime, we'll keep in touch. But um, I got to say, Martin, don't sign off because I need to talk to you and Joe later. But everybody else, I will see you guys next week. Say goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Joe. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.